as much as we can but this is not a substitute for actually studying there's going to be information that's going to be on your exam that we may not get to today so uh, make sure you study please all right unit eight is about the years after world war ii up to present day post world war ii there are two major developments first is the cold war what's the second one decolonization where you have 80 different newly independent states being created after world war ii you know, you need to know to def you need to know how to define the Cold War. The Cold War is a ideological, a political, economic rivalry between the two world superpowers, between the United States and the Soviet Union, coming out of World War II. You need to know why these two countries became superpowers in the first place. First, World War II severely weakened the traditional powers in Britain and France and Germany, the old powers of the world in the 19th century are militarily and financially weakened by the war. The United States was relatively untouched by World War II. There's not really a lot of fighting that went on in the continental United States. So our economy was still thriving after World War II. And for the Soviet Union, even though much of the Soviet Union was destroyed after World War II, the Soviet Union's command economy, its centralized planning gave it an advantage and it allowed it to quickly recover from the war. So the United States was relatively untouched by the war, while the Soviet Union's command economy allowed it to quickly recover from the devastation of the war. Both countries became innovators in technology, specifically when it comes to nuclear technology. Both countries have, were able to develop the nuclear bomb and then later on the hydrogen bomb, making them the two superpowers of the world. You need to know the causes of this rivalry, the causes of the Cold War. The Cold War is about ideology. It's about beliefs. It's about economic and, and political systems. The United States represented democracy. It represented capitalism and free, the free market. While the USSR, the Soviet Union, believe in conflicting ideology. They believe in authoritarianism, where you have government that has a lot of control over people's lives, over the economy, and they believe in communism. And we both try to struggle to shape the world according to our image. The next cause of the war is mutual distrust between the two superpowers, especially after World War II, where many of the promises that the Soviet Union made during the war were not kept, including not occupying Eastern Europe anymore and allowing Eastern Europe to have elections. But instead, Eastern Europe was turned into what? Communist states, communist satellite states, including East Germany. All right. How did the Cold War affect the process of decolonization? So post-World War II, many of the former colonies became independent states. And the pattern is soon after, in many of these independent states, they faced internal conflicts, regional conflicts, civil wars, as they struggle to determine what kind of country do they want to be. And the two superpowers hope to influence those outcomes, oftentimes supporting different sides of those conflicts. Oftentimes, the United States would support the Democratic side. Sometimes they don't even have to be the Democratic side, as long as they're the anti-communist side that's good enough for America and the Soviet Union supporting the socialist or communist side of those conflicts. All right, next, the Western and Eastern Bloc. The world was divided into three segments. First, the Western Bloc. These are the countries that are aligned with the United States during this conflict. They're usually made up of democratic states, especially in Western Europe. And then you have the Eastern Bloc, also known as the Soviet Bloc. These were the countries aligned with the Soviet Union, primarily communist countries and primarily from Eastern Europe. But then there's countries that are non-aligned, and they made up the non-aligned bloc, led by three countries, Ghana, Indonesia, and Egypt. They chose not to formally align themselves with any of the two superpowers. On your exam, this is going to be a question. Anybody remember what I told you, what the reason was for many countries not aligning or not officially aligning with any of the two superpowers? Take it they played both of the superpowers, that's, but that's not the main reason. They thought it was going to be imperialism all over again. Remember, they're trying to get away from imperialism. 
And they thought by aligning themselves with the, one of these two superpowers, they're going to be dependent on these two superpowers. So they don't want to be dependent on other countries anymore. They're trying to get away from imperialism. All right. Effects of the Cold War. So we talked about the causes. Now let's talk about the impact of the Cold War. It developed new military alliances, including the most powerful alliance ever be, to ever be created in the world, which is... Which alliance? Led by the United States? NATO. The North, um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Led by the United States and composed by mostly democratic Western European countries, including Canada in North America. What was the goal of NATO? The goal of NATO is to counteract Soviet aggression and to stop the spread of what in the world? Mm -hmm. Communism in the world. So to counteract Soviet aggression and to stop the spread of communism in the world. The Soviet Union will respond with their own military alliance. What is it called? The Warsaw Pact. Mostly made up of communist Eastern European countries. Another if impact of the Cold War is the arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States. As we competed for military strength, especially nuclear weapons, and start stockpiling more and more destructive and more and more weapons uh, for ourselves. And... It also involves the two countries spending a lot of money, spending a lot of their budget on military and defense spending. All right, what did this lead to? The rising of tensions. As these countries became more and more, uh, had the capability of destroying one another, the prospect of MAD, mutually assured destruction, loomed over the world. And we knew that if this Cold War ever turns hot, it will result in the annihilation of not only of these two superpowers, but they're probably going to take the rest of the world with them. The irony about nuclear weapons and the danger that they pose and the threat that they pose to the world during the Cold War is that they were probably the only thing that stopped the Soviet Union and the United States from actually going to war with one another. If it wasn't for the threat of nuclear annihilation, the Soviets and the Americans would have probably gone to war with, with one another right after World War II. Does that make sense for everybody? So the only thing that prevented World War III is the prospect of nuclear annihilation. Next, another effect of the Cold War, what do we put here? Proxy wars, even though they were not in direct conflict with one another, they played out this rivalry in proxy wars. These are regional conflicts in which the two superpowers supported opposing sides. By support, we mean financially, arms, training, and sometimes even American and Soviet troops getting involved, like American troops being involved in Vietnam and Soviet troops being involved in Afghanistan. But very rarely do you have Americans and Soviets shooting at one another. That usually does, did not happen. All right. Why did they engage in these proxy wars first? They wanted to expand their ideologies. The United States wanted to create more democratic free market states, and the Soviet Union wanted to make more communist authoritarian states. That's the main reason for these proxy wars. Second, they wanted to undermine each other. They wanted to undermine each other. The reason why we supported Islamic rebels in Afghanistan is because we're not, not because we're big fans of Islam or, or, or Muslim, um, nations, it's because we wanted to undermine the Soviet Union and we wanted to undermine their goals. We wanted to prevent them from achieving their goals and vice versa. Yes, ma'am? To kind of prevent them from gaining, from achieving whatever they, they wanted to achieve. All right. And number three, proxy wars are preferential to an actual direct conflict, which would be a nuclear conflict. To avoid nuclear conflict. So we have plenty of examples of proxy wars. 1950, we get the Korean War. That's why today Korea is split into two, an authoritarian communist state in the north and a democratic capitalistic state in the south. Today, the two Koreas are still technically at war with one another. In Africa, we get Angola. The Angolan Civil War is a proxy war where both the superpowers supported different sides in that conflict. Next, Cambodia in Southeast Asia. What's the V stand for? Vietnam, where the United States attempted to prevent a communist regime from unifying um, Vietnam, and Afghanistan, which directly contributed to the end of the Soviet Union. 
All right, number seven, you need to be able to answer this question. What made socialism and its more aggressive form, communism, very attractive to the different peoples of Latin America, Asia, and Africa? Years and years of economic and political imperialism have resulted in severe economic inequalities. And coming out of World War II and coming out of independence, the main concern of many of the people in Latin America, many of the people in Africa and Asia, is economic inequality, especially inequality in what area? Land. Where you have a few people that own the land and sometimes even foreign corporation owning much of the land of these countries. And what made socialism and communism particularly attractive to many of the peoples around the world is that they promise e um, economic equality. They promise land reform, the redistribution of land. They promise that the government will take the land from those that own it and then redistribute it. And if you're a poor peasant living somewhere in Latin America and Africa or in Asia, suffering under these impact of imperialism, these might be very attractive to you. These prospects might be very attractive to you. The nationalization of key industries. A lot of times, key industries within a country are owned by foreign corporations, are, are assets owned by foreign companies. Like, for example, in Mexico, many of their industries were owned by American companies. A lot of their land owned by American corporations. And when you have socialists and communists preaching that when we get to power, we're going to take those assets, we're going to take that land and then redistribute it or nationalize it, have the government control it, that's very attractive to a lot of these people. And socialism promoted social welfare, like government provided health care, government provided education. And if you're poor, very attractive. Karl Marx, the person that founded the ideology of communism, is also anti-imperialist. So communism is an ideolo ideology born not only as a criticism of capitalism, it's also born as a criticism of imperialism. And if you're one of these uh, people living in these former colonies, communism might be very attractive to you. All right. Note the rise of communism in China, how China became a communist state. 1911, we get the Chinese Revolution that overthrew the Qing Dynasty, ending 2,000 years of dynastic rule. And then right afterwards, we get a civil war between the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party. That civil war will temporarily stop. Why? Not World War I. Because who invaded China? Oh, Japan. So World War II will temporarily interrupt, uh, interrupt they'll, they'll stop fighting each other for a little bit and fight, fight the Japanese. When World War II ended in, in 1945, the Civil War is back up. Who won? The communists. the communists won. That's why today China is a communist state. It's a communist authoritarian state. They were led by this man right here, Mao Zedong. You need to know how Mao Zedong transformed China. When many of these authoritarian communist states the pattern is always the same. Govern direct government control of the economy. That's the characteristic. The government will take control of industries. It will collectivize the farms. It will nationalize the factories. So nationalization of key industries, the redistribution of land, land reform, the collectivization of land. And then Mao even implemented his own version of the five-year plan called the Great Leap Forward, whose goal it is to industrialize China. He did this by, again, nationalizing factories and industries, collectivizing the farms. How successful was the Great Leap Forward? Not very. It resulted in 20 to 50 million Chinese people dying. And all the while, his people are starving. He refused foreign aid from other countries because it's going to make China look bad, and he refused to stop exporting food away from China because he wanted the public to believe that his version of communism is a good version of communism. It's a successful one. Under China, under Mao, China will become what it is today, an authoritarian, one-party state. Today, if you go to China, you try to criticize the Chinese Communist Party, or you try to criticize Mao, you might go to jail for that. 
Yes. So they nationalized key industries, they collectivized the farms, very similar to the Soviet Union. Number 10, the rise of communism in Southeast Asia. You get in Vietnam, communism rose in Vietnam. It was the communists that won Vietnam's independence from France. Anybody remember the name of the communist leader that defeated the French? I'm sorry, that fought against the French to win Vietnamese independence? And then later on, will fight against us to unify Vietnam. You're close. His name is Ho Chi Min. Ho Chi Min. He was the communist leader that will fight for um, Vietnamese independence against France, and then later on will fight to reunify Vietnam under commun a communist state, but he will have to go through the United States in order to do that, which he was able to do. Cambodia will fall under communism as well. Anybody remember the group of people that were communists? Very good. They committed a lot of atrocities. They're called the Khmer Rouge. Anybody remember the name of their leader? Should be easy to remember. His name is Pol Pot. All right. Socialism also took root in the newly independent state of Egypt with their leader Nasser. He nationalized a lot of the key industries in Egypt, including which key economic asset? The Suez Canal. Even today, the Suez Canal accounts for about 20% of the national revenue of the Egyptian government. So 20% of the budget of the Egyptian government comes from the profits that they had in the Suez Canal, that they're earning from the Suez Canal. If it wasn't for Nasser nationalizing that key economic asset, it would still be under the control of the British and the French. And they're the ones that are going to be profiting off that, that's that key economic asset. Socialism and communism also took root in Latin America because, again, Latin American countries had the problem of economic inequality, especially land inequality. Most of the land were owned by a few, especially the Creoles uh, of Latin America. And during the age of economic imperialism, countries like the United States and Britain bought a lot of the land and bought a lot of the economic assets of these countries. So what socialism and the more aggressive version of communism promises, the redistribution of these assets, the redistribution of land, land reform. That's why Mexico, Venezuela, and Guatemala, they elected or they were able to overthrow their current governments to establish socialism in their countries. Or at least not full-on socialism, but some socialist policies. Cuba was just straight up what? Communists. Under the rule of which guy? Fidel Castro. Who the United States tried to overthrow, but failed. And that put Cuba closer to the Soviet Union. And then that made Cuba invite the Soviet Union in to install missiles in Cuba. And that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right. Next. What led to colonization and the dissolution of empires? We kind of talked about this briefly. The, the main reason for the fall of empires after World War II are the world wars themselves, especially World War II. It financially and militarily weakened many of the imperial empires around the world, particularly France and Britain, were financially weakened by the war. So much so that they were not able to hold control over the colonies after World War II. Another reason that might pop up on your exam tomorrow is that colonial troops participated in World War I and World War II. And that fostered a sense of nationalism in many of these colonial troops and it intensified resistance against imperialism. We saw that after World War I and we're going to see that after World War II. The difference is in World War II, they're going to have some successes because these powers are severely weakened from the war. All right, 14, which groups of people usually led independence movements in the colonies? Intellectuals, the educated, those that are exposed to enlightenment ideals. Like, for example, the America in the 1700s, right? This is before this unit A, but in the 1700s, our founding fathers, intellectuals, educated people exposed to enlightenment, they led the independence movement in the United States. In the 1800s, in the 19th century, Latin America, 
It was the educated Creoles like Simon Bolivar that led those independence movement. And now, after World War II, in Asia and Africa, it will be the intellectuals, it will be the educated uh, who will also lead these movements. Like, for example, Gandhi was an educated man in, from India that led the Indian independence movement. All right. Answer number 15 for me. Which ideologies were essential to inspiring independence movements around the world, especially after World War II? Nationalism. Nationalism is the main one. Years and years of imperialism have fostered a national identity within the people of the colonies. And as you fear closer to the people that share the same values and culture and ethnicity as you do, you begin to desire your own country, an independent state. But you also have other ideologies that kind of play into this, like, uh, like socialism and communism can also push people to want independence. So for example, in Vietnam, the desire for independence coincided with the desire to create a communist state. All right. These um, colonies gained their independence through a variety of methods, mainly two methods, negotiations and armed conflict. If you were a former British colony, chances are you got your independence from the first method, negotiations. The British were so weakened by the war and public opinion about imperialism back in Britain is turning negative that they had to peacefully let go of a lot of their colonies. They negotiated to be let go. Like, for example, which colony in South Asia became free right after World War II? India. And remember, right, right with India is Pakistan because independence and partitioning happened at the same time. All right, and you got Africa. This is supposed to say Gold Coast. Which colony in West Africa was given independence peacefully by the British? It used to be called the Gold Coast Colony. Ghana, which is one of the figures, the leading figures of the non-aligned movement. Their president, Nkrumah, believed in pan-Africanism. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In Asia, which American colony was peacefully let go by the Americans? The Philippines. Philippines today is not an American territory. But there are some colonies that are going to have a harder time. If you're a French colony, chances are you had to fight for independence. Like the French colony in Africa, in North Africa, called Algeria. Algeria where the Berbers and the Arabs living in Algeria were forced to fight for their independence. Who resisted independence in Algeria? White minorities. A lot of white French settlers migrated to Algeria, and they were the main obstacles for independence. Then you got a Portuguese colony in Angola, also had to fight the, Ang the Portuguese for independence. It took them a lot of years. They didn't get their independence until like the 1970s, I believe. What happened to Angola after it got its independence from Portugal? Civil War. What usually happens to many of these newly independent states, internal conflict. In Asia, who's the poster boy of having to fight for independence? Another French colony, Vietnam. So under Ho Chi Minh, they fought the French for independence. And then right after that, that's going to escalate into a proxy war called the Vietnam War, where they're going to fight to reunite Vietnam into a communist state. 16. What is the root cause of all these internal conflicts that we have alluded to right after independence? Borders. National borders that were inherited from what? From imperialism. That were drawn by imperialists. And when these countries became independent, they will inherit those national borders. These conflicts will result in one of two things. First, Rival groups being stuck together in the same national borders, being stuck together in the same country. We saw that in Rwanda. We saw that right now in the Philippines. We see that in India where you have Muslims and Hindus that don't particularly like each other. And Britain wanted to give the whole of India its independence and wanted to make India its own state. All right. And then you also have a nation being separated into different countries like the Kurds of the Middle East. All right, you need to know examples of how 
religious groups, ethnic groups challenge these borders? First, you have the Igbo people challenging the borders of what is now what? Nigeria. The Igbo people wanted its, its own country. It did not agree that the southern part of Nigeria should be part of Nigeria because they believe they have a different national identity than the people of Nigeria. Then you have people from Quebec, which national identity was arguing for its own country, the French Canadians. It's called the Quiet Revolution. It became very popular in the 1960s. This third bullet will be on your exam, transnational movements. These are movements that called for the redrawing of national borders, not according to how they were drawn by imperialists, by the white Europeans, but according to shared national identities, whether shared culture, language, ethnicity. So two of these movements today are pan-Africanism, which is um, the advocating for the unification of the African people and pan-Arabism which advocates for the unification of the Arab people in North Africa and the Middle East. They believe that these borders don't make any sense and that people should be united together under one country if they share the same national identity. All right, the Muslim League is a religious movement that challenge what? The borders of what would become what? So here's what happened. During the negotiations between Britain and India for independence, um, the Muslim minority of India organized a group called the Muslim League. And during these no negotiations, the Muslims of India advocated for a what? A separate state for Muslims. And that will become known as what? Pakistan. So this will result f to an, into partitioning which means India will be divided into two independent states, one Hindu and one Muslim. What would happen as a result of partitioning? 1947, when India became free and it was partitioned, mass migration. You got a lot of Muslims moving up north into Pakistan, a lot of Hindus moving down south into the modern day India. And that's gonna result in a lot of people dying and animosity between the two countries today. today these two countries don't like each other. There's a rivalry between Pakistan and India. And one of the reasons why is disputed territory, like the Kashmir region, is still disputed by both countries. So this religious divide that exists in India um, still exists today and still is the cause of a lot of the conflict between the two states. Then we get the complicated creation of the modern day state of Israel, 1948. What ideology drove the creation of Israel in 1948? What is that called? Zionism. Very good. The desire for an independent Jewish state. That's what Zionism is. What was in the way of Zionism in World War I? The fact that the land that they want to create their country in was controlled by the Ottomans, and it was mostly inhabited by what kind of people? Arab Muslims. After World War I, that land, what we call Palestine, became a British mandate. But it saw a lot of Jewish migration into those lands, putting the two groups of people in conflict with one another, the Arabs that live there versus the Jewish immigrants that are, are migrating over there hoping that their dream of Zionism will be accomplished. So the issue back then is still the same issue today. You have two groups of people that believe the same piece of land is their land. Who's right or who's wrong, that's going to be up to you. But today, there's still a lot of conflict as a result. What's the UN solution for this conflict? A two-state solution where you have a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews immediately accepted this plan and they declared independence in 1948 but while the Arabs refused this plan because they felt that this is another form of colonialism and imperialism and this is the Europeans meddling with um, their own affairs. That's why today you still have a lot of conflict in this region. All right, 19. How did newly independent states respond to their economic issues following decolonization? So a lot of these states 
when they were under empires, they were made to be dependent on their mother country. But now that they're free and they're independent, they're still pretty dependent on other countries as well. So they're going to face a lot of economic issues. So as a response to these economic issues, you need to remember one thing and two words, direct intervention. The governments of these countries directly intervene in the economies of their countries to kind of fix the issues, to kind of help the transition between being a colony and being an independent state. So direct intervention. In other words, a lot of these countries adopted socialist policies. They had their governments control key industries, key economic assets. Like in Egypt, where Nasser controlled the Suez Canal and many of the industries in, in Egypt, where the government took control of those key economic assets. All right, then you have another example in India, under the prime minister, the first and only female prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi. She instituted her own version of a five-year plan that aimed to industrialize, I'm sorry, make India more self-sufficient. That's their main problem. They're having to depend on other countries for survival. And Gandhi or Indira Gandhi wanted to make India more self-sufficient. Sufficient agriculturally when it comes to food by promoting agricultural science in gr the Green Revolution and nationalizing key industries like the banks in India. But the key takeaway here is many states chose to directly intervene in their economy. They chose to be more socialistic. All right, 20. After decolonization, what migration pattern did we see in many of these former colonies? Many of the peoples from the former colonies end up migrating where? To their former mother country. What do we call, what's the word? Metropoles. Metropoles is the word that refers to former mother country. Give me an example of this type of migration. The Philippines, a lot of Filipinos after their, they got their independence right after World War II started moving and migrating to the United States. You got people from Algerians moving where? Who's their metropole? France. You got South Asians in India and Pakistan moving where? In the UK. You need to know why? The reason why is during the years of imperialism, the metropole introduced their culture, their economic and political systems, their language to their colonies. And as a result, the people of these colonies became very familiar with those culture, with those economic and political systems. <laughs> After independence, many of these countries face a lot of economic turmoil and they wanted economic opportunity, so they move. And they specifically move to metropole because they're, they're very familiar with the culture, the language, the political and economic systems of those countries. For a Filipino, it only makes sense to move to the United States because they already speak English and they're familiar with American culture and they're familiar with American society. Indians, same thing for, for the UK. What's the result of this movement? Very good. It's going to affect the metropoles, the receiving societies, by diversifying their culture and their diversifying their ethnic makeup. All right, and then 21, we talked about how existing orders were challenged. In India, British rule was challenged through nonviolent means like the Salt March and the Homespun Movement. Who led this resistance against the existing order? Gandhi in the United States. Uh, discrimination and segregation were fought by the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King Jr. And apartheid in South Africa, the rule of the white minority in South Africa was challenged by who? Nelson Mandela and the ANC, the African National Congress. In some states, authoritarian dictators took power and they responded to challenges to their authority with violence. Like in Chile, a dictator rose up to power that committed a lot of atrocities, including executions and torture. He was actually supported by the United States in a military coup that overthrew the previous socialist government of Chile. Anybody know his name? His name is Augusto Pinochet. In Uganda, same story, a military coup led to this man becoming 
um, the president of Uganda, dictator of Uganda. He fed his enemies to alligators, torture, kidnappings. Idi Amin is his name. Idi Amin. On your FRQs, guys, if you don't remember the name, just say the dictator rose to power, right? Just describe it as much as you can if you don't remember the details. This it will be Uganda. He specifically targeted South Asians first. Then in Cambodia, you got the Khmer Rouge committing mass atrocities that killed about 25% of the Cambodian population. This will be on your exam, number 23. In the post-Cold War world, most of the conflicts that happen around the world today is not between two states. What's happening in the Ukraine, between Russia and the Ukraine, is very rare in a post-Cold War world. What usually happens nowadays is it's a country versus a non-state entity, a non-affiliated entity. So non-state entities. You can call them whatever you want. You can call them rebels for those that sympathize with their cause or for those that don't sympathize with their cause, you can call them terrorists. But the point is, it's not two states going at each other anymore. It's a country going at um, non-affiliated or non-state entities. We talked about two of them in Peru, which non-affiliated non-state entity caused a lot of trouble in Peru. What's it called? The Shining Path, very good. The Shining Path. What kind of group is it? It's a communist group. They want to install a communist government in Peru. And they were very active in the 80s. Killed a lot of people. The Middle East, which group did we talk about? Al-Qaeda. They tried to um, stop Western intervention in their country. And then yesterday we talked about the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. The main reason for the collapse is this first one, economic stagnation. Command economy and centralized planning made the Soviet economy very inflexible. And by the 1970s, it wasn't growing very much. It was stagnating while the American economy was booming in the 1970s. We didn't outgun them. We outspent them. Then we have the arms race where the Soviet Union, even though they were facing a lot of economic difficulties, they were forced to keep up with the amount of spending that we were doing especially when who was elected to, to the presidency, well, Reagan, where he spent a lot of money on defense. And then that, in turn, forced the Soviets to spend a lot more money, which in turn contributed to their economic problems and the discontent back at home, back in the Soviet Union. And then the failed invasion of Afghanistan that drained the resources of their country even further, contributing to more discontent, more public discontent in the Soviet Union. And then the final nail in the coffin was Gorbachev becoming the leader, instituting these three policies. Perestrokia means the loosening of government control over the economy, the implementation of some free market policies. Glasnost is giving the Soviet people the ability to speak their minds, to have an open discussion about what's going on in the Soviet Union. And then the promise that they will no longer militarily intervene um, in other countries to support communist governments. All of this, this will be on your exam, led to peaceful protests all around the Soviet Union. It didn't fix the problems of the Soviet Union, it just led to people voicing their discontent about what's going on. A lot of these communist governments, especially in e Eastern Europe, did not fall because of an armed conflict and then fighting against the Soviet Union. They fell through these, ma these mass protests, these peaceful protests. Make sure you remember that. That will be on your exam tomorrow. 1989, we get the fall of the Berlin Wall, which symbolizes the fall of Soviet control over Eastern Europe. And 1991, we get the Soviet Union being dissolved and the end of the Cold War. I know that was a lot. Anybody have any questions? Look through your review. If there's something that you need me to emphasize a little bit more, let me know. All right, make sure you study tonight. Do the review if you want 10 points on your exam. Yeah.
Make sure you sign up and sign back. Thank <laughs> you.